I'm Pastor George, and I want to welcome you to Bethel Church Online. If this is your first time with us, please send an email to hello at Bethel.org to let us know you're here. And also, we've got a Starbucks gift card just for you. Now, don't forget, Trunk or Treat is this Saturday, and we're asking you to sign up online to join us. Decorate your car or motorcycle for our physically distanced drive through experience. Please sign up today at Bethel.org slash trunk or treat. This is the final week of the series entitled Living on Purpose. Next week, Pastor Frank is going to be beginning a new series called Reach. It's about evangelism and you're not going to want to miss it. Again, it's great to have you here with us. Now please join us as we worship the Lord together. Oh 
Thank you for worshiping with us. I have a couple of important reminders for you. Today marks the first day in our week of fasting and prayer. We start October 25th and go all the way to Friday the 30th. 
Visit Bethel.org for more information and for the prayer points from Pastor Frank. Also, this Saturday is a very important day. Don't forget to set your clocks back one hour and don't forget to invite and volunteer at our drive through Trunk or Treat experience. We're so excited to spend time with our community and we would love for you to be a part of it. Go to Bethel.org slash Trunk or Treat for more information and to find out how you can volunteer. Next Sunday, November 1st, we have baby dedications. Go to Bethel.org slash events to register. Now remember, inviting others to both online and drive through church is one of the easiest invitations you're ever going to make. Use your favorite social media to like, share, subscribe, and most importantly, invite others. Now as we transition into a time of offering, we want to thank you for your generous support and your faithful giving. You can continue to make a difference by giving one of three ways. The first is online at Bethel.org slash give. The second is through our Church Center app. And the third is through texting. You can simply send a text message to 84321 and in the message box, type the amount that you want to give and press send. It's that simple. Watch this next video to see how Convoy of Hope is initiating one day to feed the world. No alarm, you oversleep. You reach to turn on your lamp, it only clicks. You sit up to listen for familiar sounds throughout the house, it's silent. The power is out, your world is dark. You know how hard it is to go without electricity? Being powerless limits progress, opportunity, and life. How powerless do we feel when we don't have food or water? The truth is, we don't often go without them, but millions around the world do. The Convoy of Hope's One Day to Feed the World campaign can help transform the lives of millions of people so they can move forward, take on challenges, and embrace life. Convoy of Hope is a nonprofit organization that has helped more than 130 million people throughout the world by feeding hungry children, educating farmers, empowering women, and bringing relief to families in need. The average person works 240 days per year, but giving just one day's wage, you help restore power to people all around the world. And that power, combined with nutritious meals, relief supplies, and hope, opens the door to Christ's love, education, and so much more. Your one day transforms their every day. We want to thank you again for your generous donations. It's because of people like you that we can continue to make a positive impact in our world. Now, please join me as we welcome Pastor Frank as he brings us the last message in the series, Living on Purpose. Hey, well, welcome to Bethel Online. It's great to have you tuned in today. If you're a guest, so glad that you're here, especially all of you as well from San Jose and Santa Clara campuses. So thanks for being a part of our online experience today. Um, I wanted to give you a quick heads up before we get into today's teaching. We are gonna come to the Lord's table and we're going to recognize communion today. And I'll do that at the end of our, at the end of my message and then we'll have a time of worship and then we'll come to the table. So you'll wanna grab a piece of bread or a cracker or maybe some, some type of juice so you're ready to go uh, when we come to that point. Well, I was reading a story some time ago about an elderly couple in, um, in Tupelo, Mississippi. And uh, they were getting ready for bed and the husband looked out the window and noticed that the light was on in his tool shed. And he had a pretty, pretty large shed. So he took a, a little closer look and here he sees four guys emptying his shed out. I mean, they're, they're stealing from him. So he calls 911 right away. The operator answers and tells her uh, what's, what's going on. And, and, and the, the operator says, well, well, are they in the house? No, no, they're not in the house, but they're, they're robbing my, my shed. She says, look it, just lock the door. Uh, we'll get somebody out there. We'll, we'll be able to take your report and, and that kind of thing. He says, well, like, can't you get somebody out here right now? No, no, we don't have anybody available right now. Well, he hangs up. He calls back in about a minute. He says, you know what, I just called a minute ago and I told you about four guys that are robbing uh, my tool shed. He says, never mind. He says, I've shot them and, 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 and they're dead. So you don't have to worry about it. And he hangs up. In three minutes, 
five patrol cars, two canine units and a SWAT unit shows up at his place. And they catch, uh, they catch the thieves red-handed. They're cuffing them. They're taking them out. One of the police officers turns to Sam. That's the elderly gentleman. He turns to Sam and he says, hey, he says, I thought you said that you, you shot these guys. And Sam replied, well, I thought you said there was no one available. Um, there are two morals to this story. Uh, one is never underestimate a senior citizen. Never underestimate a senior citizen. Uh, the other moral is the one we're gonna build on today, and that is urgency changes everything. Urgency changes everything. We conclude our Living on Purpose series. We've been in it for six weeks now. We've been learning how to cooperate with God's spirit and his strategy in order to fulfill his mission, both his mission in us, but also his mission in the world, which is to help people have a shot at following Jesus, making disciples everywhere, neighborhoods and nations. And I've been beating this drum. The colossal challenge to this mission is we're in a spiritual war. There is an unseen adversary. Jesus pointed to the evil one himself and says, he's real. And you need to be aware of that. And he shoves against everything that, that God wants to do in and through our lives. And more than that, we're also called not to fight like the world fights. We see a lot of fighting right now that's going on. And it's ugly. We're not called to charge the darkness that way. We're called to do what the very first church did in Acts chapter 2 in the day of Pentecost. And God's presence, His Spirit was poured out on that group. And the next thing you know, <clears throat> you begin seeing some of these big ideas, these core behaviors of a disciple. And you see them unfold in Acts 2, but then you see them through the rest of the New Testament. And uh, we've been unpacking these five big ideas because they really constitute what it means to live on purpose. And I call it a 5G life because they all start with G and they're easy to remember. Gather, we want to gather in healthy community, healthy fellowship. It matters. Grow as a disciple. Remember, that's about next steps. It's about our habits. We want to give back in service to God and others. So in other words, we want to learn how to live a generous life. It's so much more than our money. It's a lifestyle. We want to go as a witness. We looked at that last Sunday. Go as a witness, never off the clock. And the final one today is to glorify God always. Glorify God always. What does it mean? Some people have grown up in church. They've heard that phrase and they still don't know what it means. It means to point back to God. That's what it means. It means to point back to him. Um, it's, it, it means to make his son, Jesus, famous and not try to make ourselves famous. We glorify God always. Jesus said in the great Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, these are well-known verses if you've been in church any length of time. He said, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. It cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Verse 16, in the same way, in the same way that that city built on a hill cannot be hidden, in the same way that people who light a lamp don't cover it with a bowl, in the same way, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. There it is. Glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, Jesus says, look, at, there's a way to live. This whole idea, these metaphors of salt and light, there's a way to live that we can actually lead ourselves and others to glorify God, to point back to him. And I want to finish today with some thoughts on that idea. And I want to do it out of the Old Testament story of Nehemiah. If you have a Bible today, or you have it on smart device, I hope you'll turn to the book of Nehemiah. There's also an outline. Uh, if you're on our, our website, you can just go to notes. Uh, if you're in Facebook or YouTube, there should be a link for notes. And I've got some additional helps today. So I hope that you'll utilize those because I think you'll find them really helpful. Well, Nehemiah was not a typical Old Testament leader. He's my favorite Old Testament leader. And in that day, in that age, the, the, the titles of leaders were prophet, priest, king, or judge. 
He was none of those things, yet operated in all of those offices. This guy was a lay, a lay person. He worked in a, in a foreign king's court, tasting wine. Doesn't sound so bad, right? But he tasted it for poison. So it could be a short-lived job, but, 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 but Nehemiah, he, 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 made it, he made it through. He lived a thousand miles away from his homeland. And his story is a powerful picture of how to stay on mission in life, how to stay faithful to a life that glorify, glorifies God over the long haul, a life that truly is making Jesus and not ourselves famous. And the, and the thing about Nehemiah, he battles the same things we battle. So, I mean, when you read his story, this guy batters, battles fears and worry and distractions and uncertainty and hateful and angry people. I mean, he's got this task that is literally way bigger than him. And by the time Nehemiah's story is written, his once great nation of Judah, the once great city of Jerusalem, I mean, it was a hub of commerce. It was a hub of influence and prominence, and it's all ruined, and it's been ruined. It's a mess. The people are broken, and the city is broken. It is a story of urgency. And I want to open with just a few uh, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Then they said to me, that is Nehemiah writing his story, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and, and disgrace. People have been making their way back to Jerusalem over years and years. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, which was massive. Just one of the pieces of the wall was like five football fields. I mean, the thing was massive. It's been burned with fire, verse 4. When I heard these things, he said, he heard what was going on in his hometown. I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Verse six, let your ear be attentive to and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, speaking of himself, is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. He says, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed your commands, decrees, laws that you gave your servant Moses. I want to leave you with what I call the ABCs of a life that glorifies God. It's not the only things that go into a life that will glorify God, but you can't get there without these three things. And I call it the ABCs because they start with A, B, and C. So it's real simple. Number one, abandon myself to God daily. Abandon myself to God daily. It is so easy. It is so easy in our culture to absolutely allow our lives to get wrapped up in stuff that really doesn't matter. It's stuff that doesn't make a difference for all eternity. And it's not necessarily bad stuff. It's just stuff that gets out of order in our lives. I've talked about it many times, the idea of disordered loves. There's some things we love more than we should. There's some things we don't love nearly enough. And it gets us, it gets us in trouble. You know, it might be pleasure. It might be power. Today, right now, in our season, it's, you, you see politics front and center. And I would just remind us, just a, what, a couple of weeks out to an election, Jesus said, seek the kingdom of God first. If you're a follower of Jesus, seek the kingdom of God, his will and ways first, Matthew 6, 33. Why? Why? Well, because his kingdom will outlast all political parties and political movements. Now, I'm not saying don't be engaged. You should vote. If you don't vote, don't whine, okay? Um, you should know the policies and the positions of people running for office, especially the highest office. Everybody gets caught up in personality. Don't. Look at their policies and their positions. What do they actually believe and do? For example, you should measure them against biblical values, which are healthy, life-giving values. For example, the value of human life. All human life matters in the Bible. So do they value that? 
whether, you know, do they value uh, black life? Do they value unborn life? Do they value all life? It's important to know. It's a moral issue. I realize everything's politicized. Straws are politicized. Everything's polit but that's not a political issue. It's a moral issue. What's their view on truth? This is huge. Presidents, they, they appoint judges. What's their view on truth? Do they see certain things they understand as right and as wrong? And do they understand that those things don't change with time? Or is it all relative? You better know that because that's going to inform the way they appoint judges. What's their view on marriage, on family? It's a biblical issue. These are moral issues. So I'm not saying don't engage in, in political process. What I am saying, make sure our politics or anything else for that matter doesn't get in the way of God's kingdom. And I can define it in the words of Jesus. What is God's kingdom all about? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. That's the bullseye and love your neighbor as yourself. You can't separate the two. If there's anything that gets in the way of those two things, it's sin and we're wrong. Jesus taught, deny yourself, abandon yourself. If I abandon myself and I take up, he used the, the metaphor, uh, my cross and I follow him. Th this is not popular to, to talk about. It's not popular in our world and it's not even popular in the church. But if I'm willing to abandon myself to him, what it produces, we like, we love. Because Jesus said it's the only way to find a real, fully alive, eternal, forever life. That's what he taught in Mark 8, 34 and 35. He says, it's the way to a fully alive life. Well, Nehemiah is an excellent example of abandoning himself to God. Just in verses four and five out of chapter, chapter one, as he writes his story, uh, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned, fasted, prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, great and awesome God. Uh, he's worshiped there. Uh, who keeps his covenant of love who and with those who love him and keep his commandments. What's happening here is Nehemiah allows himself to grieve over the brokenness he's heard about. He grieves over broken people, over a broken city. He prays, he fasts and he worships. Four things that he does. Starting today through Friday, six days, I'm inviting us to do the very same things Nehemiah did thousands of years ago. Let's grieve over the brokenness in our city, our county, our state, and our country. It's not good. We need to grieve over that. We need to confess our own issues, our own contribution to the brokenness. We need to pray, fast, and worship. Now, I've got some helps for you. Uh, you can go on our homepage and there will be a prayer and fasting handout. It talks to you about what fasting is. I give four, I, uh, four opportunities for different kinds of fast. Uh, I'm gonna do a total food fast, but you don't have to. There's different ones to do. Pick one and do it for the next six days, okay? There'll be prayer points on the back of your outline that will help you pray through this week. So I hope that you'll do that. So I'm not going to take the time to talk about those things because it's already, it's already information there for you. But what I have done is I've asked Pastor John if he would come for a few moments and he would share with us the importance of worship, uh, especially when it comes to as a way of abandoning ourselves to God. And P. John, it's great to have you here, man. Come share. Thank you, Pastor Frank. Appreciate it. Greetings, everybody. It's a pleasure to be up here and to be able to team teach with Pastor Frank. I've been assigned the task of talking about abandoning ourselves to God daily. And Jesus taught us to deny our selfish wants. He taught us to abandon ourselves to the Lord. And he taught us to take up our cross and, and follow him. Now, we all know that at a time when selfishness seems to be the order of the day, the call to self-denial seems crazy. But as crazy as it may seem, true abandonment is the only way to establish a deep relationship with Jesus. I mean, think of the disciples. They walked away from the life they'd always known and just followed him. It's pretty impressive. 
And think about this, the Bible makes no provision for the changes in our culture. In other words, we have not been granted a pass because our lives are busy and stressful. Jesus still requires for you and me to be all in as it relates to our relationship with him. So if we agree that we're called to abandon ourselves and give our lives over to Christ, why is it so difficult to do? Well, I came across this quote. There is a significant difference between a personal determination to try harder and complete abandonment of oneself to God and his purposes. The former rests on human effort and the latter rests on divine sufficiency. In other words, the reason that we find abandoning ourselves to be such a challenge is because we often try to do it in our own strength. Our natural instincts point us towards self-preservation. The only way we can allow our will to take a back seat is if we allow God to drive the car. Yeah, I know, I know, it's easier said than done, but it helps to remember that this is not a cathartic one-time endeavor. We're called to abandon ourselves daily. So, how do we do it? We have to establish daily disciplines that allow God to take us where he wants us to go. Pastor Frank's already talked about this, about the fact that Nehemiah is such a great example. In that first chapter that bears, of the book that bears his name, he tells us that he grieved, he fasted and prayed, and he worshiped. We should grieve about the things we've done that have displeased God, and we should humbly ask for his forgiveness. We should fast and pray to institute the discipline of self-denial and adjust our focus heavenward and we should worship. Now we need to tell you that if the only time you're worshiping is the 20 minutes we spend in worship on a Sunday morning, I guarantee you that will not be enough. Find a Christian radio station and let those songs permeate your heart. Look at Christian videos on YouTube. As a matter of fact, with this fast that's starting today, an idea may be to listen exclusively to Christian music over the next five days. And rather than rely on your favorite news outlet, spend that time listening to encouraging messages from God's Word. Remember, worship is not an event. It's a lifestyle. Praise to the Lord should be something that's constantly on our lips. I mean, it makes sense. Uh, if you truly see something or want to see it, you focus upon it. So my question is, in a world full of uncertainty and pressure and COVID, what do you focus on? The easiest thing to focus on is all the negativity that surrounds us. But interestingly enough, the Bible tells us to do quite the opposite. In Philippians, it says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Some time ago, I was doing some work on my house and I had to rent a dumpster. And a gentleman came and backed that dumpster into my driveway. After doing so, he jumped out of his truck and started walking toward me. As he got right next to me, I looked at him and asked, hey, are you a Christian? He looked at me quite surprised and he says, well, yes, I am. How did you know? I answered, because it's all over your face. May that be the challenge to all of us. Let's live a life so abandoned to God that our very countenance reflects the image of Jesus to everyone around us. Pastor Frank. Thanks, Pastor John. It's a great word, great illustration. The letter B in these ABCs of uh, living a life of uh, glorifying God, number two, is believe in the bigness of God always. 
Uh, that's the B. Believe in the bigness of God always. And uh, I love uh, in chapter two, and you see this throughout, throughout Nehemiah's story. I mean, you see this over and over again. But in chapter two, uh, verses 17 through 20, uh, it, it reads this way. Then I said to them, this is Nehemiah talking, uh, you see the trouble we're in. He's, he's rallying the troops right now, right? Uh, Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and will no longer be in disgrace. Verse 18, I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let's start rebuilding. So they began the good work. But, but when Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite and officials of Geshem uh, the Arab heard about this. These were other leaders, right, in the, in the region. They mocked and ri ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? Of course, the king gave him permission. Uh, I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. I love that. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim uh, or historic right to it. Let, let me just say that any vision, any vision that's worth you, you, your effort and mine, our resources, it's worth our time and our energy is going to be bigger and beyond our own strength. And not only that, it's going to bring opposition. It just is. It's true if you want to build a great marriage. It's true if you want to build a great family. It's true if you want to build a great business or a thriving church. There are things in motion that work against that. A couple of Fridays ago, the official board and our pastors all came together for a vision night. It was a great time. One of the things, one of the questions that I posed to them that I wanted them to consider was the following. And I've, I've put it in your outline. Uh, I think I might have put it in your outline today. If not, it'll be on your screens. What does the Lord invite or ask Bethel Church to be in one of the most influential places in the world? and in what might be the final generation before his return, before Jesus' return. He's coming again. What would, he, what would he ask of us? What would he invite us to be? What could that look like moving? What could we look like moving forward? What should we look like? What must we look like moving forward? Another way I, 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 I described it to the group that night is, may Bethel Church be a place where? Fill in the blank. By the end of our time, and it was a great time, uh, we had a lot of discussion, a lot of back and forth, wrote down some big vision ideas. And now we're working on refining those, putting them in a vision story, and we'll, and we'll present them uh, when, when we're done with that. Pray for the process. Please pray for the process. These are important times. These are difficult times, and these are opportunity-filled times. We need God's vision moving forward for Bethel Church. We need God's dream moving forward for Bethel Church. And there is, there is no time to waste. There is no time to waste, waste when, it becomes, when it comes to rebuilding lives or ministries, families, in neighborhoods, and in nations. Now is the time to move forward. When God called Nehemiah, what he called him to was impossible without God. It was impossible. I was thinking again, when Laura and I were going through the, the process with the, the PULPA committee here at Bethel, the pastoral search committee, and just praying and trying to discern, God, what, is this the next step that you have for us? And uh, I can remember on more than one occasion, all alone with God, considering, okay, Lord, are you, are you really calling us here? Are you calling me to be the next senior pastor here? And I can remember more than once saying to God, Surely, surely, surely there is somebody that is more qualified than I am. Uh, there's got to be somebody that's got a better education and have got more skill. Surely there's got to be somebody. And, you know, God, God would say to me, first of all, don't call me Shirley. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, he didn't say that. But um, and, and by the way, I'm not looking for sympathy points. I have a good education. Um, I, I, I have gifts and I have skills by God's grace, and they're, they're, they're pretty good. But they're not great. 
they're not great. This is one of the most influ influential places on the globe. The potential for kingdom impact, the potential for eternal impact is off the charts here. That's why it's worth being here. For that alone, it's worth being here. So it was in those moments more than once when I told God, isn't there somebody else? And he would remind me, impression, that impression on, in my gut, on my spirit. Frank, it isn't even about you. It's about me. It's not about you. You see, he'd bring me back to the reality. It's about God and his glory. It's not about me. It's about him. Nehemiah understood that it was a new day and it was a new season for his people, that God hadn't abandoned them, that God hadn't forgotten them, that God was on the move. He would provide, he would guide, he would strengthen them. He would enable them to rebuild what was broken. But it wasn't just for them, it was for future generations. The same is true for us, church family. The same is true. He's the same God today as he was in the life of Nehemiah, and he'll be the same God tomorrow. We have limitations. God doesn't have limitations. I get weary and I get weak. God doesn't. Nehemiah placed his trust and his confidence squarely in the bigness of God. Squarely. And so should we. What would God have us accomplish by the 75th anniversary of Bethel Church? It's only a couple of years away, 75 years. What would he have us accomplish in the next five years in neighborhoods and nations? Church, we, if there was ever a time to dream big, if it was ever a time to pray hard, if there was ever a time for all hands on deck and say yes, to what God's next step for us, if there was ever a time, now's that time. And just like Nehemiah, it's gonna require that we believe in the bigness of God. Not us, but him. Finally, number three, the letter C, commit to God's mission together. Commit to God's mission together. If we wanna point back to God, we wanna bring glory to his name, we need to do it together. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 3, and I encourage you to read the whole chapter, read the whole book, but this is just a, a snapshot of what's going on in this rebuilding project. Elisha, the high priest, and his fellow priests went to work, and they rebuilt the sheep gate. There's all these gates that are a part of this massive wall, okay? It's where people did business, at the gates. The men of Jericho, verse 2, built the adjoining section, okay? Uh, the fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassanah. Uh, Merimoth, son of Uriah, next to him, Meshulam, these names are hard, uh, made repairs. And next to him, Zadok, also made repairs in the next section, repaired by the men of Tekoa. Verse 6, then uh, the Jeshana gate was repaired by uh, jo Joada. Next to them, repairs were made by men of Gibeon, Gibeon and Mizpah. What's all that about? If you read on, you see 18 times the phrase next to him or next to them. It's over and over and over and over. In 32 verses, it appears 18 times. It is a powerful picture of God's people standing shoulder to shoulder, moving forward together, committing themselves to the mission together. If you read on in, in, in this book, chapter 4, they overcome weariness and discouragement together. Chapter 5, they correct injustice and poverty together. Chapter 6, they confront intimidation and betrayal together, especially Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a phenomenal leader. In chapter 8, they overcome grief together. I mean, does this not have a picture or paint a picture of our lives? In chapter 9, they confess. They, they, they turn from their own sins, their own failures, and the failures of their ancestors together. In chapter 10, they tithe or give a first fruits offering back together, celebrating God's provision in their lives together. God gave Nehemiah a vision. He was the leader. But it took hundreds and thousands of people to stand shoulder to shoulder to rebuild and restore what was broken. And now fast forward 2,400 plus years later, here we are, and God invites us to the same thing. 
He invites us to a vision of rebuilding and restoring what's broken and lost. I've been saying it this whole series. He invites us to charge the darkness. How? We need to learn and continue to gather together in rich, meaningful community, in relationship building. The world is dying for it. We need to grow as disciples. It's all about next steps, uh, and it's about our habits. We need to give back in service to others for Jesus' sake. Well, that's all about living a generous life. We've got to go as a witness, right? As a witness. Talked about that last week. You're not off the clock if you're a follower of Jesus. This is who I am. I represent him. And, I, and all of this glorifies God. It points back to him. It points back to him. It makes Jesus famous and not me and not you. To do this, we're going to have to abandon ourselves to him daily. And if you're like me, sometimes several times a day. We're going to have to believe in the bigness of God, even with everything in our fiber doesn't want to. We have to believe in the bigness of God. It's not about me, not about my bigness, not about my greatness. And I need to com- we need to commit ourselves to the mission together. It must be done together. All right, I want to leave you with a story. Joni Erickson Tata, some of you will know that name. Uh, She is a best-selling author, she is a speaker, she has been a quadriplegic for most of her life, a tragic accident as a teenager, uh, has left her paralyzed from the neck down. There is some movement, but not a lot. So she's speaking at a conference and she took a Q&A session. And this is one of the questions that was asked her how do you keep going? How do you keep leading and serving and creating despite your obvious physical challenges? And I think we have a a picture of her up on the screen. Her answer is gold. It's gold. She answered, this is the only time in history when I get to fight for God. This is the only part of my internal story when I am actually in the battle, in the battle. Once I die, I'll be in celebration mode in a glorified body in a whole different set of circumstances. But this is my limited window of opportunity. And I'm going to fight the good fight for all I'm worth. Bethel family, there are no do-overs. There are no mulligans in the the game of life. There are no mulligans. There are no dress dress rehearsals. You and I are allotted a certain amount of time. We have a certain amount of time on this planet to fulfill God's purpose in our generation. This is exactly what was behind Jesus' point in his urgent statement, again, a statement of urgency in John chapter 9. And he, t- he tells his disciples in John 9, 4 and 5, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. It's another one of those must statements Jesus made. He didn't make that many of them. We must do the work of the one who sent me, which was God. Night is coming when no one can work. Verse 5, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. If you're a follower of Christ, so are you. It's true of all of us who claim his name. Now is the time, now is the time to shine. I wanna pray with you. Jesus, thanks for today and thank you for this life of Nehemiah. Thank you for this series. I pray you build these behaviors into our life. I pray that we We revisit them often and work on them regularly. I pray today for you to bring encouragement and strength to those who need it. For those that maybe are outside of your family today, Lord, that are tuning in, I'm so glad that they're here. And and friend, if that's you today, there is no better day than today to say yes to Jesus. You may not understand all of it, but if you understand that you need a savior, you want your past forgiven, a purpose for living in a home in heaven, you want to say yes to Jesus. And I invite you to do that right now. Why not just pray right where you are? Just pray, Jesus, I come to you just as I am. I give you the good, the bad, the ugly. Tell him that. Best as I know how, I lay it at your feet. 
Forgive me for living my life apart from you. I go in my own way instead of his way. Come into my life. Be the forgiver. Be the leader of my life. And then help me to point back to you. Help my life to bring glory to your name, to point back to you, to make you famous and not me. If you prayed that prayer, love to know that. Easy to let us know at uh, hello at Bethel.org. It's a quick email. Just say, hey, I prayed the prayer. Let us have your, your contact information. We'll help you on your journey. Hello at Bethel.org. At this time, I'm going to invite you into a time of worship. Then I'm going to come back and then we're going to come to the Lord's table and remember his broken body and his shed blood. Why don't you wor worship with us at this time? my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed
Lord, we praise your name and we celebrate your name today. Thank you for the privilege of being able to worship and the power of worship. Sometimes worship is the battle. And man, it breaks the darkness that sometimes presses in against us. We're thankful for that today, Lord. Thank you. We worship you today. We honor you today. Well, we want to come to the Lord's table at this time. So I hope that you have a, a cracker or a wafer, a piece of bread or something, and, and uh, then some, some type of juice. Uh, the great apostle Paul, he had wrote uh, to the church at Corinth. He says, you know, what I received from the Lord, he said, uh, was, I pass on to you. He says, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat it, remember me. After the meal, he took the cup. And he said, this cup represents the, my shed blood. And as often as you drink it, remember me first. For every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, he says, you proclaim, you proclaim me and my return, my return. His return is closer today than it was yesterday. And at this time, I, 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 wanna, I wanna pray with you. I want us to take the wafer together because Jesus was broken so we, could, we can receive wholeness and healing, a forever life. Um, Isaiah talked about that, the prophet in the Old Testament. He talked about, you know, by his woundedness, we're, we're healed. There's healing today. There's supernatural healing today. There's healing for family and relationships, for depression and, the, and, 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 and sometimes the, the pressures of today's world. Uh, there's relief for that. There's healing for that today. And whatever your need is, um, I want us to pray before we eat it together. And if you'll just join me right now. Jesus, in this moment, we just come to you. Because of your brokenness, there is healing that's available to us. And then one day, it'll be forever. And Lord, in this moment, I pray you break in. Whatever the need might be, there might be some today that are battling um, depression. I just have that, have that impression on me, Lord. And I just, I just pray you begin to lift that cloud. You begin to break in and bring freedom in their life. Uh, for those who need physical healing, in the name of Jesus, I pray for, for, for miracles, God. I pray for miracles in families and marriages and for those that have lost their jobs and God help us as a church just to continue to help people who are in need and it's increasing and we just pray that you help us help them. But we pray for, for, for opportunity. We pray for people to be able to get back to work. We pray for businesses and churches to, to be opened up. We pray for that, Lord. And I pray that you meet needs today as only you can bring strength, bring wisdom, bring direction where it's needed. And we'll be quick to thank you. May you bless this way for us. We remember again your broken body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's eat it together. Again, after the meal, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new deal. It's the new covenant. It's the new agreement in my blood. He would spill his blood on the cross so that anyone who wants it can be forgiven and free. And he paid the price for our foul ups, for our failures, for our shortcomings. Nobody gets to God on their own. Nobody's that good. I'm not. Nobody is. We need a bridge over troubled waters, the old song says, and Jesus is that bridge. And in this moment, I'm, we're gonna remember again his great symbol of love, which is the cross. God loves you and he sent his best for you. And he wants a relationship with you through his son. Let's pray over this cup together. Jesus, thank you. It's hard to get, it's hard to get our head around what you did for us. Co-eternal, God in the flesh, willingly lay down your life for us. Our God died for us. What religion can boast of that? You're it. You died for us, but you didn't stay dead. You rose again and you're returning one day for your own. We remember again that there is freedom and a forever life because of what you did for us, because you spilled your blood. May you bless this cup May you fill our hearts with joy today. Fill our hearts with joy as we drink it together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's drink the cup together. Thank you, Lord, 
Let's worship him just for a moment. We thank you, Lord. We honor you today, Lord. We celebrate you. We celebrate new life. We celebrate forever life. We, we, we celebrate, God, the opportunity to go and to make a difference with our lives. It's all because of you. It's all about you. And we celebrate you today and we worship you. And I'm going to invite you just to briefly, we're going to worship again in song. And then uh, our host will come and wrap us up. Lord, we just worship you. Bless us as we worship again in song. Thank you for joining us today. If you just prayed that prayer, or if you're new to Bethel Church, we would love to connect with you. Please send us an email at hello at Bethel.org, or join us in the Zoom lobby by clicking the link in the chat window. Fasting and prayer begins today and goes through to Friday the 30th. Go to Bethel.org to learn more. Saturday the 31st, come to our drive through trunk or treat experience during the day, and then, that night, don't forget to turn your clocks back one hour. Pastor Frank mentioned discussion questions today that are tied to the message. They are available to you at Bethel.org live. Just click the discussion questions button. And next week, Pastor Frank begins a new series called Reach, a study on evangelism. You're not going to want to miss it. Again, thank you for joining us today and God bless you.